Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program will begin momentarily. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Professor Chris Moriello. Thank you. Could everybody please grab a seat? Thank you very much for joining us. Before we begin tonight, just a few announcements, general announcements. Um, there are restrooms on each side of the exit signs in the back if you go this way. Um, also, uh, please remember that this is a public event, so there'll be some photographs taken, so if anybody has exclusive contracts to their image, you might want to cover your face. They'll be walking around taking pictures, but if you don't want a picture taken, please tell the photographer that you don't want a picture taken. And also, in case of emergency, please follow the exit signs and leave the building immediately. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd ask everyone to stand and please welcome the Salem State University Community Chorus in the singing of our national anthem. can be seated. Also, I remind people to silence their cell phones for the duration of the commemoration. <clears throat> Welcome to our annual Yom HaShoah commemoration of the Holocaust. Once again, my name is Chris Moriello. I'm the director of the Salem State University Center for Holocaust and Gen Genocide Studies. Whether you're joining us at the Higgins Middle School today or remotely, 
via a web feed, please know that you're welcome to the solemn event. It's a very important event that we're celebrating tonight and that we're commemorating the Holocaust tonight. Your presence here speaks volumes to your commitment to not only the memory of the Holocaust and its victims and survivors, but also to combating racism, prejudice, and anti-Semitism that continues to plague our nation and the world. Before we begin with my formal remarks, I'd like to acknowledge some of the important people who have joined us both here and online. First and foremost, the Holocaust survivors and their extended families. We're honored to have you here tonight with us. Second, our honorees of the Sonia Schreiber White's Upstander Award, Debbie Colton and her student, Ariel Mogulesco, and Liz Horowitz, the award, who has been awarded the Salem State University Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies Community Service Award. Also, as you came in, you may have noticed that there are many middle, high school, and some university students that have escorted you in and handed out the programs. They're an important part of our program. We welcome them. Their energy, their youth, and their commitment is noted. Finally, I'd like to draw special attention to the members of the Peabody Veterans Council, especially the veterans of the 26th Yankee Division, one of the liberating divisions of the Goosen Camp near Mauthausen, and they're over here. So thank you very much for your service. I would also like to thank our elected officials and representatives who will be joining us via a remote video a bit later in the program. And finally, I'd like to recognize the family of Sonia Schreiber-White, one of our founders for the center, along with Harriet Wax and Peabody over 35 years ago. I'm so pleased to be back in person once again and to see so many familiar faces without masks on. It's wonderful seeing you, but know that out in the internet sphere, there are over 150 to 200 people joining us remotely via our production online. I think about Sonia every day. Sonia guides much of what I do at the center. She did tell me at one point that I had to do it and that I had no choice. And she was right. And 30 years later, I'm now bringing her message and her work along with Harriet's to the Salem State University and we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. So in a recent interview, I was asked if commemorations and memorials such as this were worthwhile doing every year. After all, anti-Semitism, racism, prejudice, and dare I say genocide, continue to happen. The Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and the Center for Holocaust Boston North that preceded us has been running this event for some 35 years continuously, either in person or online. But there continues to be, no matter how much we speak to of it here about combating anti-Semitism and racism and prejudice, it continues to plague our nation and our communities. It's a very legitimate question of whether we should continue to do this every year, but the answer is yes, we should continue to hold Yom HaShoah year after year as a ceremony of remembrance, because memory is important. We must remember that the Nazis and their collaborators targeted the extermination of all Jews of Europe and systematically murdered six million Jews and countless millions of other non-Jews during World War II. But memory itself is not enough if it does not advance understanding and action. If we remember the Holocaust as a story of historic anti-Semitism leading inevitably to the mass, Nazi mass murder of the Jews of Europe, we are in danger of missing the most important factor of all genocides. It was not hatred in itself that caused the Holocaust. It was the radical politicization and mobilization of hatred, in this case, anti-Semitism, in the service of contemporary ideology that caused the Holocaust. And I wanna emphasize that again. It's not the hatred in itself, 
it's the opportunistic mobilization and politicization of hatred that caused the Holocaust and that is behind all genocides. The fundamental shift in our perspectives moves the ceremony from memory alone to understanding and action. It compels us to identify and confront those political ideologies, ideas, movements in our contemporary world that seek to politicize and activate anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, and prejudice. It's those political ideologies and movements that seek to gain from pitting us against each other or exploiting our differences against our common humanity and mutual respect for each other's human rights. It compels us to see hateful words, symbols, tweets, posts, and videos that continue the propagandist role of framing and activating stereotypes and myths in the service of convenient politics and ideologies that can, if unchecked, lead us to conflict, war, and mass violence. So as we gather in memory of the Holocaust, let us recognize that we are in a contemporary storm of political and ideological activation of hatred, racism, and prejudice. Let us use the memory of the Holocaust to recommit to understanding how the unimaginable becomes possible and how we have to power and democratic obligation to stand up against anti-Semitism, racism, and hatred in our own present. Thank you. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Rabbi Richard Perlman. Ruchim Habaim, welcome all with blessings. Yom Hazikaron Lishoa Legvura, literally meaning the Holocaust and Heroism Remembrance Day. It's known informally in Israel and abroad as Yom HaShoah, as we've heard, an English Holocaust Remembrance Day. It is observed as one of the two Israel Days of Commemoration of approximately six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust by Nazi Germany and its collaborators, and also the Jewish resistance that took place during that period. In Israel, that day is a national memorial day. The first official commemoration took place in 1951, and the observance of the day was anchored in law passed by the Knesset in 1959. The second day of remembrance in Israel is Yom HaZikaron, which took, just took place. It's Israel's national day of remembrance to honor soldiers and civilians who lost their lives during the struggle to defend Israel and our people. Since the early 1960s, the sounds of sirens on Yom HaShoah will stop traffic and pedestrians throughout the state of Israel for two minutes of silent devotion. The siren blows at sundown as the holiday begins and once again at 11 a.m. the next morning. People step out of their cars, all people step out of their cars and stand in silence together. Yom HaShoah is a day where we hopefully can put aside our political differences or the calls of deniers and honor those who really and truly suffered and died or were negatively touched during the Shoah. As we have heard from witnesses, from those who live to tell us the truth from their own lips. Nazis believed that Germans were racially superior. They believed Jews were a threat to the so-called German racial community. While Jews were the primary victims, the Nazis also targeted other groups for persecution and murder, as you heard. The Nazis claimed Roma people with disabilities, the Slavic people, especially Poles and Russians, and black people. They were biologically inferior. The regime persecuted other groups because of politics, ideology, or behavior. And these groups included communists, socialists, Jehovah Witnesses, gay men, and people 
the Nazis called asocials and professional criminals. This evening we gather as a community in one voice to say never again. Hate. Hate failed then. And it must not succeed now. As we hear the rumblings of hate, even today, as we just heard, together we must send a single voice, a loud and clear message that we can never tolerate hate of any kind. There's no room for hate in our world, never, ever again. And as we begin this evening, we will begin in procession of flowers, followed by the lighting of candles. Our future, our youth will present the flowers in many settings, white lilies and sometimes pink daisies are brought forth on Yom HaShoah or Holocaust observances as they present a symbol of the theme of today, which is tikva, hope. And then the candles, the flames will burn from one candle to another. And they will symbolize the memories of the nishamot, the souls, the beautiful souls and lives that glowed and still shine brightly among God's stars and people. They will remain alive in our hearts and in our minds forever. As we march, we reenact and remember the song and the words that the people of the Shoah sang together. They sang these words even as they approached the chambers of death. Anima amin be'emuna shlema. Beviyat hamashiach afalpi sheyit mamea im kol ze achachel lo bechol yom sheyavo. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and though he tarry, I will wait daily. For his coming. Ani ma'amin. Thank you. 
as they leave, I'd just like to acknowledge that those were the students of Vinnie Vincent Raponi, one of the teachers here at Higgins Middle School, and these are his students from the Higgins Middle School. And the young woman lighting the candle, as well as the row sitting with her right here, are the student Salem State University student Hillel, who have joined us as well. So welcome. At this point, I would like um, for us to see a video which sends greetings from Salem State University. And to provide greetings from the university is the president of the university, John Keenan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this important day of remembrance. Yom HaShoah, a Holocaust Remembrance Day, is a day for remembering the six million Jews and others who were murdered during the Holocaust. It is also a day to remember and honor the survivors, those who are still with us and those who have since passed away. On this day of remembrance, we reflect on those who continued to hope despite the unimaginable horror and indignities that they were subjected to. Among them are those who were imprisoned at the transit and labor camp of Teruzin. These prisoners included outstanding Jewish artists, musicians, scholars, and writers from Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany. Despite being subjected daily to Nazi violence, starvation, disease, and the threat of being deported to death camps, these prisoners, these human beings, created drawings, paintings, music, and theatrical productions of the highest quality. While they faced merciless and relentless horrors, they never lost the will to live and remind us all of what it means to be human. Tonight, we will hear from author Mark Ludwig, author of the book, Will to Live, the Music of Terezine which reflects on this bravery. As we remember and honor the victims, we must acknowledge the conditions that allowed this horrific atrocity to occur and actively seek to change them. We must reject the troubling rise in anti-Semitism, both within the United States and across the globe. We must reject acts of violence and attempts to dehumanize all of those who have been othered. We come together to create stronger, kinder, and more respectful communities for all. So thank you again for joining us today and being part of this moment of reflection and remembrance. And a special thanks to the Combined Jewish Philanthropies of Greater Boston and the Congregation Ahab Bat Shalom for their support, music director Lynn Shane and the Salem State Community Chorus, Rabbi Richard Perlman of Temple Ned Tarmid, Professor Chris Mariello and Progr Program Director Dan Achette for their dedicated leadership of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Salem State and the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies Research Associate, Regina Casalina, and all who helped make this meaningful event possible. Thank you. And now you will see a video from Senator Joan Lovely representing the second district of Essex. Good evening, I'm State Senator Joan Lovely. I would like to recognize the Salem State University Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and Higgins Middle School for organizing and hosting this moving Yom HaShoah ceremony and the scholars and community leaders present here today. Thank you for sharing your expertise and insight and for taking the time to elevate the voices, experiences, and history of our Jewish residents. For over 30 years, we have gathered as a community to remember the over 6 million men, women, and children who brutally lost their lives during the Holocaust, and to honor the legacy and memory of the loved ones, friends, and neighbors who survived the harrowing ordeal. From the first stirrings of anti-Semitism under Nazi Germany in 1933, to the end of World War II in 1945, Hatred, bigotry, and ignorance were used to justify crimes against humanity in the annihilation of the Jewish people. We must never allow this to happen again. It is up to each one of us each day to fight hatred wherever it occurs. We owe it to every single person impacted by the Holocaust, every family that was separated, every child that was orphaned, every spouse that was widowed, to remember the gravity of this time in our history. As we mourn, we also owe it to their memory to honor them in the face of unimaginable horrors. 
I am grateful to the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies for continuing to advance this discourse. For decades, the center has worked to broaden the knowledge of the dangers of anti-Semitism, discrimination, dehumanization, and hatred, while reaffirming the importance of humanistic values, including justice, equality, and acceptance. And thank you to the center, because we will hear from Mark Ludwig, who will share the stories of Jewish artists and musicians who found the will to contribute to this world despite the tragedy that surrounded them. That is the power of human spirit, the tenacity to defy the odds and find meeting in the bleakest of circumstances. As Viktor Frankl once said, quote, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So now, in all the years ahead, let us choose to live our way with love, empathy, and compassion. Thank you. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker for tonight. <clears throat> Mark Ludwig is a Fulbright scholar and a leading authority on the Terrazin composers and Holocaust music. He is a member of the Terrazin Memorial Museum Advisory Board and founder of the Terrazin Music Foundation. Ludwig's most recent book is entitled Our Will to Live, published in 2022. At Boston College, he teaches a course titled Music During the Third Reich. Ludwig is also a violist and Boston Symphony Orchestra member emeritus who has blended his musical career with promoting social justice and tolerance. It's my pleasure to present Mark Ludwig. For this Yom HaShoah program, I've selected music and art created by victims of the Holocaust. These artists have left us a rich cultural legacy. The history of their courage and creative determination are testimony to the inextinguishable strength of the human spirit. For many of you, this will be your first encounter with this music of a lost generation of composers. And I wanna briefly share my first encounter that three decades later would culminate in the book, Our Will to Live. Chris, Dan, and I hope this program will be an inspiring experience for you as we mark Yom HaShoah. So in the late 1980s, I came across a biography of Leo Beck, a progressive rabbi who was imprisoned in the Theresienstadt concentration camp. And two lines in the chapter titled Theresienstadt caught my attention. The first, poets and musicians tried to capture the hunger, cold, and sadness in words and music. And this was later followed by a composer, Victor Ullmann, who was noted for writing an opera in the camp. So like many of you, I immediately wondered, who was Victor Ullmann and these musicians and poets in Terezin? And of course, did any of their works survive? So a few months later, driven by these questions, I was walking down Parzyska Street. This is this beautiful boulevard lined with Art Nouveau buildings in the fabled Jewish quarter of Prague. And hoping to find remnants of this lost repertoire, I entered the Czech Music Fund in Prague. Now this was the central repository for Czech music. And just imagine the scene. The director handed me several scores to examine. And this happens to be just one of those. It's handwritten, it's not the actual manuscript. But in those days, the music was not published. And of course, I wanna take this music home with me. And you know, this is Czechoslovakia coming out of mothballs, all right, Soviet occupation. Of course, I asked them, could you Xerox this? All right. 
and they looked at me like I came from another planet, all right? Probably some of you who are much younger will look at me and say, what is a Xerox, okay? <clears throat> well, so what I wanted was to get copies, and of course they said, don't worry, we will copy, and there's stacks of this music I'm looking at, all right? Um, we'll, we'll copy it for you by hand. And I'm gonna say about five, six weeks later, I receive in the mail this huge bundle of music. But to return to that moment when I'm looking through this music, I opened up a score, it was a string trio by Gideon Klein. And yet this was a new name for me and there were more scores and names to follow. But I'll tell you is that more than 30 years later, I'm still astonished how music, art and poetry of such a high order was created in a concentration camp. So I think an inner overview of Terezin's history before and during World War II is an important prelude to the music we're about to hear. Terezin is 60 kilometers northwest of Prague, and on October 10th, 1780, Emperor Franz Joseph II laid the cornerstone of what would be two fortresses, a large and a small, to protect the Austro-Hungarian Empire from Prussian armies. With its diminishing military role, the large fortress became a quaint garrison town, as you can see in the scenes from this charming turn of the century postcard. While the small fortress served a much darker purpose, holding political and military prisoners, most notably Gavril Princip, the assassin of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. In the late fall of 1941, the Nazis selected the large fortress as quote unquote, a ghetto settlement for Czech Jews as exemplified by this work by a prisoner. So like the postcard, he includes the same landmarks, the church steeple and the barracks, but he places them within the camp's walls in the shape of a Jewish star. The first transport of 342 Jewish men arrived to convert a garrison town of what was 7,500 people into a concentration camp that at one point held over 63,000 prisoners. Terezin's purpose expanded in scope and scale. Jews within the German Reich and occupied countries were sent to Terezin and ultimately to the East for extermination. More than 90,000 of the 141,000 Terezin prisoners were sent to the East. In addition to serving as a labor transit camp, Terezin later became a propaganda vehicle for the Nazis, who labeled Terezin a paradise ghetto. In 1944, they forced the prisoners to produce and participate in two propaganda projects, a staged International Red Cross visit and a propaganda film that survivors later called The Fuhrer Gives the Jews a City. So you're seeing on the screen a drawing that was one of the series of stage scenes for Terezin's beautification that included an outdoor concert pavilion for bands like the Ghetto Swingers, seen in this propaganda still, as well as facades of storefronts and a bank. This is a photo of a transport entering Terezin. Prisoners arrive carrying bundles up to 50 kilos. And so for a moment, what I'd like you to do, place yourself in this photo. What would you select beyond the essentials of clothing, food, and medications to bring with you? What I think is really remarkable is that many amateur and professional musicians chose to smuggle in musical instruments. This was perilous as the Nuremberg racial laws forbade the ownership of instruments by Jews. So in this photograph, this is among the hundreds of thousands, and I want to emphasize hundreds of thousands of confiscated instruments. So think about the logistics of getting an instrument in. Imagine trying to get a cello in. How do you smuggle that? And we do have an account where a person had cut their cello into pieces, put it into the lining of their clothing, got it into the camp, glued it back together. Now, I can tell you as a professional musician who old, owns an old, fine Italian instrument, if you cut your instrument up, 
you have now devalued it dramatically, all right? But the other thing, and I think a lot of you can relate to it, whether you're a professional or amateur, if you play an instrument, you have a bond to it. You get to know it, you spend time with it. There's a connection. So think about not only the, the courage of this person, mm -hmm. but their determination to bring an instrument into the camp. And if caught, one was put on a transport to the east, which was almost a certain death sentence. At first, prisoners secretly held informal concerts. Becoming aware of these activities, the Nazis swung between periods of prohibition and indifference, eventually co-opting them for their propaganda purposes. With the growing number of transports, a remarkable and unparalleled cultural community developed amidst the daily reality of starvation, disease, lack of adequate medical care, and overcrowding where over 33,000 prisoners died. I want to bring you into this rich cultural world by sharing a few excerpts from a series of Terezin concert critiques and writings of Victor Ullmann, a composer and prisoner. His critiques help bring his fellow artists out of the shadow of distant memory. Further enriching our experience is artwork created by the prisoners documenting the cultural activities. They are part of some 500 works collected by this man, Carl Hermann, who has a member of Terezin's Jewish administrative leadership. In October 1944, Hermann and Ullmann received transport notices to Auschwitz. Both men made fateful decisions to leave their most valued possessions behind. Ullmann entrusted his manuscripts to a friend, while Hermann, he hid this artwork under the floorboards and in the walls of his barracks. And miraculously, they were recovered after the war. So this is Victor Ullmann, and he's sitting at the 50th birthday celebration of his mentor, Arnold Schoenberg. He was part of Schoenberg's Viennese circle. And I love the moment that's captured in this photo because you look at this, study it for a moment, look at Ullmann. He exudes an air of confidence and great promise. And in the 1920s and 30s, Ullmann carved out a distinguished career as a composer, pianist, and conductor. He was deported to Terezin on September 8th 1942, and you can see at the bottom of this manuscript where he writes the completion date of this particular piece and that it was in Theresienstadt. And there in Terezin, he soon became a towering cultural figure as a composer and producer of chamber concerts. His critiques draw us into the performances held within the barracks. He wrote about stagings of Tusca and Fledermaus, to name a few. But I want to caution you, when you think about opera, you think of opulent sets and costumes, people are dressed elegantly, um, they're in chairs that are as comfortable, if not more, than what you're seated in. But if you can see in this drawing, for the prisoners, there usually were not pit orchestras. It was a piano playing a reduction of the score of the orchestra. People used whatever, and they talked about recycling whatever they could to make maybe a costume if possible. Um, the people who were seated, if they could, they could be on a crate, on these boards going across, or they were standing. And in the winter, brutally cold, the summer, incredibly hot. Because most of these performances were either in the attic or basements of the barracks. Ullmann described instrumental and vocal recitals, choral, and chamber music programs. His critiques introduce us to inspiring musicians who brought their fellow prisoners hope and a momentary escape from despair. One of those inspiring artists was the Czech composer Pavel Haas. In the 1920s, the newly established Czechoslovak Republic was home to three towering composers. And I dare say you probably are familiar with their names, Smetana, Dvorak, and Janáček. And Haas was considered Janáček's prize pupil and successor. By the mid-1930s, 
He was a highly regarded composer of classical, film, and theatrical scores. But Haas's professional and call it, say professional and personal life suffered a dramatic turn with the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1939. Marriages between Jews and non-Jews were forbidden under the Nuremberg racial laws. Haas divorced his non-Jewish wife, Sonia, to shield her and their daughter from persecution and the transports to the East. On December 2nd, 1941, he was sent to Terezin. As you can imagine, separation from his family, along with the miserable conditions in the camp, took a tremendous toll mentally and physically on him. So this is a page, a critique page from Ullmann and Terezin, and it's titled, A Concert of the Anschell Orchestra. And he notes the performance of a work by Pablo Haas, The Study for String Orchestra. And I wanna read this excerpt to you because it also gives you a sense of the flavor of what's going on with these performances. He writes, Carl Anschell is a conductor of remarkable stature and abilities. The fact that he is heroically welded together and trained such an ensemble is proof to both his qualities and superhuman patience. Anschell is a pioneer of new music and hence his very beautiful and impressive premiere of Pablo Haas's study for string orchestra succeeds. The piece shows the hand of a musician who knows what he wants and is capable of achieving it. Haas was forced to participate in a performance of his study for the Nazi propaganda film. This is a still, but you're about to now see part of a clip from the Haas study performance that was in the propaganda film. Die karische Darbietungen werden von allen Kreisen der Einwohnerschaft gerne besucht. In einem Konzert wird ein Werk eines in Theresienstadt lebenden jüdischen Komponisten aufgeführt. So this is a still from that segment, and you can see Haas is taking a bow with Carl Anschell, the conductor, and the orchestra in the background. And I think you feel probably the same thing I do whenever I look at this segment, and I see the faces of these musicians and the audience members with the knowledge that most of them were sent to the gas chambers of Auschwitz just weeks following this critique written by Ullmann. So after the liberation, Carl Anschell went on, this is the conductor you see in this still, he went on to a distinguished conducting career. He fled the 1968 Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia and became the Toronto Symphony Orchestra music director. And here begins the first of several Boston connections because Seiji Ozawa, who was the music director of the Boston Symphony, he had succeeded Anschell before going on to becoming the music director of the BSO. And almost 50 years after that Terezin premiere, I brought the study by Haas to Seiji. And when Seiji heard the story of Anschell conducting it, he teared up and he, he became really bound to this music and its history to the point that he conducted BSO performances not only in Boston, 
but in Carnegie Hall, and we took it around the United States as part of a VSO tour. So this is a Terrazine poster of a concert that premiered Pavel Haas's four songs on Chinese poetry for baritone and piano. And it's his final masterpiece and perhaps most personal work. In fact, Ullmann, he also writes in another critique the following. The honest, courageous, and very multi-talented artist, singer, and conductor Carl Berman was an apprentice until this day. And if one has to begin by thanking him for his exemplary, distinguished, and well-chosen program, one's next duty is to joyfully thank Pavel Haas for his beautiful gift, his four songs from Chinese poetry, which premiered this evening. And then he goes on to talk a little bit about Haas's songs. He said, they're full of life and relevance. Once heard, one can no longer do without them and wants to live on more intimate terms with them. It is only in this manner that over time, new art catches on because it becomes house music. And I like the following analogy he makes. He said, it becomes like an indispensable friend, just like a good book, just like everything one earns by practicing. I can hear my parents tell me, practice, 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 okay? But let's look at this one song from the four. Um, I want you to see the poetry. It's from the Tang Dynasty. And the song, like the poem, is A Sleepless Night. And if you look at the words, I even highlighted it. The sleepless night, the wind, bamboo, moonlight, Milky Way. Natural imagery of swaying, all right? And then there's this key line, which I think will have a tremendous impact on you, is I am thinking of when we will meet again. So the sleepless night, I think we can all relate to that. We've all had them. And if, one thing we all share, you have a sleepless night, what do you do? You toss and turn, you go every which way, right, back and forth. <clears throat> when you listen in this excerpt, you can hear it, but you can visually see it. Watch the keyboard of the pianist. It's never quite settled. All right, you can see it's the tossing of the turning. you can hear it gets a little more agitated at the very end, all right? It's like we all get frustrated. When am I finally going to go to sleep? It's like looking at the alarm clock and it's 4.15, right? right? It's the same thing, but he's doing it musically to give you that, the anxiety and the tossing and turning. What I'd like you to is listen to this song for three minutes. That motif comes up periodically, but also I want to see if you observe something that happens near the end of the song that is very revealing why this is so personal to Haas, the composer. I'm 
Childlike, simple melody. With the singer coming in declaring the poem, I'm thinking when we'll meet again. <laughs> So did you notice at the very end, he breaks away from reciting the poem, singing it, to going la, 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 right? He goes to that simplistic, that childish playfulness. And think of that line, thinking of when we will meet again. Who is this for? It's for his daughter. <clears throat> it's the last piece he writes. He's about to be sent to Auschwitz. <clears throat> He probably knows he will never see his daughter again. He will not see her grow up. She will not get to know him except for one way, and that's through his music. And choosing, I believe, a song like this. It's like the message in the bottle of, this is who I am through my music. This is as much I can give of you of myself because I cannot be with you in this journey. So these two photos, here I am with Carl Berman, that very person who sang those songs in Terezin. And we were together with the Hawthorne String Quartet, colleagues of mine from the Boston Symphony. Uh, we performed in Terezin. This is right after the concert where he sang those songs and we had performed music in the camp to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first transport to the camp. And I met with Berman several times in Prague, and he shared the conductor Anschel's last moments with Pavel Haas in Auschwitz. They stood in line for the selection, and Anschel was convinced that he had survived, that he was spared the gas chambers only because Haas had a coughing fit and was sent to the left. So this is a critique of Ullmann's titled Piano Evening with Lis Herzomer. And he dispenses a bit of counsel to his fellow musicians. He writes, <clears throat> lastly, a word to our pianists. We absolutely respect the commendable competitive fervor for which they present to us the romantic composers. However, there are a few composers who deserve our interest not only because they are Jews, but also because they have talent and genius and are still not performed in the surrounding world. And Ullmann, he goes on to recommend a long list of composers, some of them that you've heard, like Mendelssohn, Schoenberg, Bloch, there's Erwin Schulhoff, and Kurt Weil, to name a few. And he, you know, he concludes this mini crusade with 
I could name many more, and I haven't even mentioned the Theresienstadt composers, and I think that all of them have written interesting works for piano. So amidst this long list of composers, we're going to turn our attention to Erwin Schulhoff, a Czech composer and pianist. Schulhoff was among the most promising musical talents of the early 20th century. He twice won the prestigious Mendelssohn Prize for composition and then piano performance. In World War I, he was wounded while serving on the Russian front, and he was imprisoned in an Italian POW camp. The great suffering Schulhoff witness reshaped his music and politics. He declared, quote, my music and communism are inseparable, end of quote. His compositions reflect his political leanings as well as the musical and cultural trends of the 20s and 30s. He was especially influenced by jazz. But Schulhoff's most fervent political de declaration, I believe, resulted in his 1932 cantata, which was set to the Communist Manifesto. Not one of his better works, but... I still have to note it, it's unusual. <clears throat> so, trapped in occupied Prague in 1941, he obtained Soviet citizenship for himself, his wife, and his son Petra. But their plans to emigrate were dashed with the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. He was immediately arrested. Schulhoff was a triple target, a Jew carrying a Soviet passport whose music was labeled degenerate and subversive. Schulhoff and Petra, as you see in this photograph, they were sent to the Würzburg concentration camp, and Erwin died there of tuberculosis on August 18, 1942. Petra drew this sketch of his father on his deathbed, and after holding his dying father in his arms, he was forced to dig his grave. And at the time of this, Ullmann noted Schulhoff in one of his critiques. And also, Schulhoff's father was in Terezin, but neither knew that Erwin Schulhoff had already died in the Lager camp. But we're going to listen not to a politically motivated work, but I mentioned he was very deeply influenced and in love with jazz. And we're going to listen to the third movement of his colorful and what I think very alluring hot sonata jazz for alto sax and piano. It's a work that's imbued with French impressionism and jazz and really representative of his genius.
Isn't that a wonderful piece? <clears throat> you can't imagine that somebody would write that and also set music to the Communist Manifesto, huh? <clears throat> but it's such a wonderful four movement piece filled with a lot of colors, playfulness, has the flavor of jazz, and yet also he fuses it a bit with his classical music training. So I want to conclude with Victor Ullmann. And one may wonder that being both a critic and composer in Terrazine, would there be a potential conflict of interest? And as a further testament to his character, there is only one entry regarding his music among his 26 critiques. And it's a grateful acknowledgement at the very end of the critique that's titled Children's Choir Concert Critique. And he writes, the best praise of the critic is probably that he heard his own arrangements of Hebrew melodies performed impeccably. So Ullmann's son, Maximilian, sang in the choir. And this is a photo of Ullmann's children, left to right, Maximilian, Felicia, and Johannes. And one can imagine how deeply emotional this performance must have been for Ullmann. Now I can tell you as a parent, one of the most emotionally dif difficult sections in writing our will to live was the following excerpt. Being quarantined with a case of the measles, Maximilian was unable to join the kinder transport. He and his mother Anna were sent from Prague to Terezin on May 7, 1942. Johannes and Felicia were separated shortly after their arrival in the UK. These four separations, followed by news later on of their family members' deaths in Auschwitz, would prove an enduring trauma for both children. In what may be a case of both bureaucratic and medical malpractice, Johannes was institutionalized in a mental hospital in 1948, where he was heavily medicated and given insulin shock therapy. He was in several institutions until his death in 2010 for homeless men. There is very little record of Felicia's fate other than that she was adopted by a childless couple and died of cancer in 2004. Felicia and her brother Johannes were not reunited until he attended her funeral. Ullmann's last work was his piano sonata number seven, dated Terezin, August 22nd, 1944, and it's dedicated to Maximilian, Johannes, and Felicia. So tonight, Lynn Shane will direct the Salem State Chorale in a performance of Ullmann's arrangement of Eliyahu Hanavi.
The title for this evening's remembrance is from Ullmann's Terezin essay, Goethe in the Ghetto. He writes, I would only like to emphasize that my musical work was fostered and not inhibited by Theresienstadt, and that we in no way merely sat around lamenting by the banks of the Babylon's rivers, and that our desire for culture was equal to our will to live. And those last words, our will to live, serve as the credo for Ullmann and his fellow prisoners. These gifted artists step out of the shadows of annihilation and remind us how precious and vital the arts are to our humanity. Perhaps there is one more lesson, the importance of finding one's voice, listening to those among us, and ultimately resisting efforts to suppress them. May their memory be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for those inspiring words and, those pre and that presentation. And also thank you to the Salem State University Community Chorus for that wonderful singing. This is a part of the ceremony I've been looking forward to for some time, and it's when we present our annual awards to our community members and students who deserve the credit for being upstanders and combating racism, prejudice, and hatred. I'd like to call to the stage now my friend Debbie Colton. I'm going to read a little bit for you. Deborah L. Colton is president and executive director of the Lappin Foundation, whose, whose mission is enhancing Jewish identity across generations. Her role as a chief ideas officer and architect of the foundation's Jewish continuity initiative, Deborah creates programs that enhance Jewish pride in young people and connect individuals of all ages to Israel and the Jewish people. Deborah holds master's degrees in education and in Jewish studies, as well as certificates, coaching, and mental health first aid for teens. She's an award-winning Jewish educator who has a particular passion for teaching about the Holocaust so its memory is not forgotten, nor its lessons lost. Deborah volunteer works include being a lasagna love chef, making blankets for individuals in homeless shelters, serving on the board of directors of the Holocaust Legacy Foundation, and answering the call whenever and whenever she's needed. And on a personal note, I've been an admirer of Debbie for years. She's invited me to her wonderful Teaching the Holocaust courses with high school students around the Commonwealth and she is very deserving of the Sonia Schreiber White's Upstander Award. Congratulations, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your beautiful words, and thank you for all you do for Holocaust education. Mark Ludwig, your presentation was truly rich a meaningful testament to the creative spirit of our people, even against all odds. Thank you for the incredibly important work you do to honor the memory of the Holocaust and its victims by preserving this important work in such a remarkable way. My warmest congratulations to honorees Ariel Mogulesco and Liz Horowitz, who both worked tirelessly to make the world a better place. It was almost 50 years ago when I first met Sonia at a class at the Gloria Stevens Exercise Studio in Peabody. Later that day, I remember telling my mother I met an exquisite looking woman with a heavy foreign accent and the most beautiful name, Sonia. My mother hesitated before responding with, I heard she's a Holocaust survivor. My mother confessed to me later that she did not yet know what it meant to be a Holocaust survivor, and certainly neither did I. But it was meeting Sonia for me at a young age, at a young adult age, that set me on my path of learning and teaching about the Holocaust so it would never happen again. 
to Sonia's children, Dawn, Andy, and Sandy. I will cherish this award given in memory of Sonia. I am deeply, deeply honored to be this year's recipient. Sonia continues to be my inspiration, like for you, Chris, to educate about the Holocaust and its lessons, and her memory fuels my work. There's not a week goes by that I don't invoke Sonia's name in some way. We all owe a debt of gratitude to Sonia and to her loyal working partner, Harriet Wax, for their vision and hard work all those decades ago, establishing the Holocaust Center Boston North, which ultimately birthed the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Salem State University. So here we are, all of us, here we stand at the threshold of time when soon there will be no survivors alive to bear witness to the Holocaust, leaving that holy responsibility to us and to future generations. The work of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and other Holocaust memorial and educational institutions will assume an even more critical role in the preservation of the legacy of the Holocaust. And just as Sonia pledged in her book, I promised I would tell. I too pledge to continue to work to honor the lives of the survivors and the memory of the more than six million Jewish souls, including one and a half million Jewish children who were murdered during the Holocaust. I want to conclude with a special word of thanks to award recipient Ariel Mogalesco. Ariel, thank you for caring enough to keep this important work going. As we move farther away from the Holocaust and with anti-Semitism at record levels in this country, we need your generation more than ever to care and to act. Thank you, Ariel, for leading the way for younger generation. Thank you. I'd like to call to the stage Ariel Margalesca. <laughs> Ariel Margalesca was a senior at Marblehead High School. After visiting Israel and learning of her own family's history with the Holocaust, she wrote in her application, from that day on, I have made it my mission to educate others about the influence of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism share stories of survivors, and ultimately make people aware of the past. She has co-chaired the Teen Anti-Semitism Task Force, as well as Stand With Us, Kenneth Laval, intern Jewish Teen Initiative Peer Leadership Fellow at Combined Jewish Philanthropies. She has helped the Lappin Foundation host Holocaust survivors at the high school, and she has been a leading student voice against anti-Semitic incidents in the community. And on a personal note, Sonia always said this to everyone that she met. It was the next generation that would take the responsibility up from her generation and our generation. And I present Ariel with the Sonia Schreiber White Student Achievement Award for her work in the community, carrying on the mission of Sonia White's and the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center. Congratulations. I just want to say a quick word of thank you to the Salem State University Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies for selecting me to be the recipient of the Sonia White's Teen Upstander Award. I would not be here today without the mentorship and encouragement from Debbie Colton. Debbie is not only an educator, but she is such an inspiration to those who want to take that first step in their Jewish activism journey. As co-chair of the Lappin Foundation's Teen Anti-Semitism Task Force, we firmly believe that education is the first step in making change. And that is why I will continue to foster my passion for education, specifically in regards to Israel, the Holocaust, and combating anti-Semitism. As Sonia's mother said to her in her final words, quote, remember to teach the world, end quote, I plan to carry this message with me as I go through the next stage of life, as I believe you cannot have a future without remembering and learning from the past. Thank you. And finally, I would like to call Elizabeth Horowitz to the stage. Thank you. 
Elizabeth. Elizabeth is our recipient of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies Community Service Award. Elizabeth Horowitz, leader of the North Shore Friends of Refugees, a local refugee resettlement group helping newly arrived refugee families settle on the North Shore. She has served as president and board member of the Clifton Improvement Association. She has also created a new curriculum to teach the history of slavery in Marblehead. Horowitz trains docents at the Lee Mansion Museum and is a member of the Marblehead Racial Justice Team. Liz is a beloved educator at Salem State University and an accomplished poet. She's a wonderful resource for the North Shore. I gave you a rug at one point, yeah? And um, it's two. And uh, she's done wonderful work resettling um, the refugees from Afghanistan and other parts of the world. And if you know the history of the Holocaust, much of it is a history of refugees, particularly 1938 and then again after 1945. So she continues a legacy as well that we uh, recognize and award here. Here you go. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Chris and Dan. Um, really, really touched. I'm not used to getting any attention at all for this. I do the dirty work. Um, but the UN re uh, defines a refugee as a person who is outside their country of nationality or residence, has a well-founded fear of persecution because of their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, and is unable or unwilling to avail themselves of the protection of that country or to return there for fear of persecution. In my experience, nobody wants to leave home, but many refugees are forced to flee. They flee for their lives and they might never see their homeland or their families again. And migrants are most vulnerable to human rights violations because they're not citizens of receiving states and due to their status, they often live in precarious situations. I believe that everyone has the right to life and liberty and everyone has the right to freedom from fear and everyone has the right to seek asylum from persecution. By resettling refugees and extending a helping hand of friendship and guidance, we bridge language barriers, housing problems, access to medical services, cultural differences, help raising children, prejudice, racism, education, and help heal past trauma. We restore dignity to those who have been stripped of it. So for that reason, I would like to thank Aman and Mebre, who fled prison after enforced conscrip conscription in Eritrea, and they both escaped only to have their boat capsized. I'd like to thank Zaid, who hid in the basement of his bombed house alone for a year in Mosul, only going out at night alone to find food. And I'd like to thank Ufran, an artist who had all of her paintings burned and whose entire family was threatened and followed by ISIS. I'd like to thank Sabor and Zainab, who were hospitalized after being attacked by the Taliban at Kabul airport. I'd like to thank Tabia, who was sent to safety in Tanzania from the Congo because of conflict and war at only 10 years of age. I'd like to thank Kalista, who after watching her mother, brother, and father murdered recently in Cameroon, where genocide is happening now, left her four children with a neighbor and fled to South Africa, where the, she then walked to the U.S. border. Her children hid in a jungle for three years. All but one survived, and they were just reunited in Lynn this October. To all of them, I say thank you for trusting me and for opening your hearts, even though your hearts were broken. There are countless stories and countless ways human rights are taken away. And I know that it's really hard not to be daunted 
by the enormity of the world's grief. But we know from Per Keavot, Ethics of Our Fathers, we know that we're not obliged to complete the work, but neither are we free to abandon it. Thank you so much. So honored. Really. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations to all the awardees. I think they were all deserving and very, very powerful, the words that they shared with us. At this point, I would like to invite back up Rabbi Richard Perlman for the memorial prayers. The El Mole Rachamim, the memorial prayer that I am about to recite is in memory of all those who perished in the Shoah, six million of our brethren, but all lives. It's appropriate to stand if you can, as we remember those beautiful souls. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Hamatz, <laughs> Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the souls of our brethren who are perished in the Shoah, men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered and suffocated and burned to ashes. May their memory endure and inspire deeds of charity and goodness in our lives. May their souls thus be bound up in the bond of life, May they rest in peace, and let us all say, Amen. Amen. We will now recite the words of the mourners' Kaddish together. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah v'almah divrachirutei v'amlich malchutei 
the Chayechon, of Yomechon, of Chaye de Chol Beit Yisrael, Ba'agala, of Vizman Kari, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shme Rabba Mivarach, Leolam Ulomel Maya, Yitbarach, Vishtabach, Vipaar, Vit Romam, Vit Nase, Vit Hadar, Vit Ale, Vit Halal, Shme de Kudisha, Barichu. Laela min kol birchata vishirata, tush bachata venechemata, da amiran de alma vimru, amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shemaya, vechaim alenu vi al kol yisrael vimru, amen. O se shalom bimromav, hu yaase shalom alenu vi al kol yisrael vimru. Amen. May the one who brings peace to his universe bring peace to us, to all the people of Israel, and to all God's nishamot, the souls of all who perished in the Shoah in heaven. And let us say, Concludes our commemoration of Yom HaShoah, but before you leave, I would like to thank a few people who made this possible. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you who joined us. Thank you for your time and for your commitment for people who joined us online. I'd also like to thank all of the award winners for tonight. I'd like to thank the Salem State University Community Chorus and its conductor, Lynn Shane. I'd like to thank our presenter, particularly Mark Ludwig and Rabbi Perlman for his moving words and his prayers. I'd also like to thank the Salem State Information Technology Department, particularly Derek Barr, who's helped us throughout the process of streaming this, and Peabody Cable, who's rebroadcasting it. I'd also like to thank, finally, my staff at the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Dan Eschett has worked tirelessly to put this together with his colleague and research associate, Regina Casalina, and our graduate assistant, Lindsay Krelzek. They deserve a great deal of credit. They make it easy for me to get up here and just speak on a certain mark. It's quite phenomenal. But I want to wish you all a very peaceful evening and a safe ride home. And thank you for everything you do in our community and your presence here tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>